Welcome. My name is Jim Bensley, and I'm the Interim Director of Northwestern Michigan College's International Affairs Forum. We're pleased to have you with us this evening as we explore the topic of protecting press freedom globally and locally. I want to welcome all our IAF members, guests, students, and those of you listening on Interlock and Public Radio. We also want to encourage you to visit the website at tciaf.com and check out the rest of our spring season lineup. Tonight, Mr. Jakob Wheeler, a Michigan-based journalist, will moderate the discussion with Dr. Raj. Jakob is the publisher of the Glen Arbor Sun and teaches journalism at Northwestern Michigan College. He's also the faculty advisor for the White Pine Press, NMC student-run uh, NMC student-run publication, and he's been published in the Huff Post, San Francisco Chronicle, Christian Science Monitor, Chicago Sun Times, and other publications. Jakob holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Michigan and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction from Groucher College. Our special guest this evening is Dr. Courtney Rash. She's the Advocacy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists and the author of Cyber Activism and Citizen Journalism in Egypt, Digital Dissidents and Political Change. As a veteran journalist, researcher, and free expression advocate, she writes and speaks frequently about the intersection of media, technology, and human rights. Dr. Ratch is an internationally recognized expert on social media, citizen journalism, and activism, and is frequently invited to comment about new media in the Middle East. She has appeared on CNN, Al Jazeera, MSNBC, and many other international outlets. Dr. Raj holds a master's degree in international relations from Georgetown University and a PhD in international relations from American University. And now, Jakob and Courtney, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Dr. Dr. Courtney Raj, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome virtually to Northern Michigan. We do hope that you come and visit once we get through COVID. Um, thanks so much. Thanks for all that you do. Um, let's get to know you personally a little bit first, if we may. Uh, tell us, what does protecting press freedom mean to you personally? And also, how did you find your way to journalism? Why is it important to you? Uh, well, there are several reasons that um, I am working in the press freedom field. First and foremost, I'm a journalist at heart. Um, my background is in journalism. I worked at the New York Times in Washington, D.C. I worked in Lebanon for the Daily Star and in Dubai for Al Arabiya and did a bunch of freelancing. And when I was in Dubai, um, I was working for a Saudi owned news organization. And I knew that when I went to work for an organization like that, there would be certain red lines such as writing about Saudi uh, women's rights or human rights. But I thought, you know, Saudi Arabia owns 70% or controls 70% of the media market there. And it's a chance to be inside what I had been writing about and studying for several years while doing my, my doctorate. So uh, I was fired and basically kicked out of the country for an article I wrote about, Nash, about public interest, uh, public safety on the national airline. So when I got back to Washington, I got into press freedom advocacy, first for Freedom House, then for UNESCO in, in Paris at the headquarters, and then with the Committee to Protect Journalists for the past seven years. And we use journalism to protect journalists. So that means every day we're reporting on attacks on the press, kind of like a news service, like the Associated Press or Reuters. And then we do advocacy on those cases of journalists who are imprisoned or murdered for their work or threatened, attacked. And we do advocacy um, on issues that affect press freedom. Tech I work with technology companies, governments, and all sorts of actors and we provide assistance and emergency guidance to journalists under threat. It's a super rewarding job. Thank you. Uh, it sounds so lofty. Um, is there a typical typical week in the life of, 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 of Courtney at, at the Community Protect Journalists or does it vary completely by what's going on? 
It definitely varies completely by what's going on. Um, there is no typical week, and I think that's one reason I love it. So maybe one week I am writing about what Twitter and Facebook are doing to label state media on their platforms and what impact that's going to have on press freedom. And then maybe I'll get a call from somebody who is under threat or an email from a journalist under threat or maybe who needs assistance getting their account back open or you know just uh, one of our awardees we got, give out an international press freedom award every year sometimes our awardees get arrested um, we might need to brainstorm about what we can do to try to get a journalist out of jail in cameroon or in pakistan we might need to take a mission well when we used to travel before covid um, you know, one time I, I went to Malta on the one year anniversary of the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was an investigative reporter and blogger there. And we met with the prime minister and the minister of justice and said, why has this case not been solved and, and trying to get justice in her murder? Um, so, you know, every day is different. It's very exciting and it's an amazing team to work with. Uh, for those of you who are listening, by the way, we're thrilled this is being co-hosted by Interlock and Public Radio and the Traverse City International Affairs Forum. Uh, if you want to participate and ask questions during the Q&A in a bit, you know, log, feel free to log on to the Traverse City International Affairs Forum's website. Um, thanks to the hosts. I wanted to ask about the biggest story, the biggest thing in our lives right now uh, is the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm wondering what impact the pandemic has had on press freedom or threats to press freedom? The pandemic has not been good for press freedom. Um, it's not been good for a lot of things and journalists are among them. We have seen that the pandemic has provided an excuse to crack down on independent and critical media around the world at a time when I think the public increasingly realizes just how important, accurate, you know, factual, timely information is. Unfortunately, we've seen the proliferation of disinformation and fake news laws around the world, which we had already seen um, in the past few years, but really, you know, now under the guise of combating public health. We've seen journalists who have been attacked and beaten for trying to cover COVID in their communities, um, both by law enforcement as, as well as by citizens. And of course, we've seen that journalists have to take extraordinary risks. They are also frontline workers. You know, most countries did recognize that journalists were um, among, you know, the most important people out there because, you know, the, the healthcare workers, the, the frontline workers, you know, journalists have to be out there to report on what's going on. Um, we've also seen the fifth year of record numbers of journalists imprisoned for their work. Now imagine more than 250 every year for the past five years, but this year they've been, and you know, for the past year, they're, they're in prison during a pandemic. You cannot practice social distancing. You cannot practice good hygiene. So it could effectively be a death sentence. We've been campaigning to get them out. Um, and then you have basically the existential threat that the pandemic poses to journalism. There have been massive layoffs of journalists around the world. The economic structure of journalism is under threat, not only because of the ongoing technology shifts, but also because advertising has declined while consumer demand is down. And so news organizations are suffering. And we've seen freelancers are particularly affected. Um, in some cases, countries require press cards in order to go do journalism. Well, if you're a freelancer, you don't necessarily have an official card. So there are many, many threats. Um, but you know, we're trying to respond to those. We have an emergencies team who has provided COVID-19 guidance to journalists around the world, I think in more than 30 languages now. Uh, we have a PPE, personal protective equipment guide for journalists covering COVID and protests. So, you know, it's a challenging year, but people really realize the need and importance of journalism. Thanks for all that you do. Um, Courtney, I, I know that you've you've written a lot about cyber activism, blogging, and social media, um, in its role in uh, in Egypt and the political uprising in Egypt. Tell us about cyber activism, blogging, and social media here during the time of COVID. So, 
Well, we saw in Egypt is that the, the citizen media there uh, were really at the forefront of reporting what was going on. Um, they were the first ones to really report on massive human rights violations there on abuse by law enforcement. And we're seeing similar trends here. So in China, some of the most important information that we got out of Wuhan came because citizen journalists and citizen video bloggers um, decided to report on the ground what they were seeing and contradict official narratives. Now, they were then disappeared, put into prison, cracked down on, their families cracked down on. So it's very dangerous to do some of this work. Meanwhile, of course, we've seen around the world that journalists are just under threat for trying to report um, on COVID. We've seen in many cases that they take their cell phones and you know, have to go into hospitals or you know, COVID care facilities surreptitiously or, or undercover or not necessarily obviously that they're journalists. And in many cases are relying on citizen journalists to provide that information in countries where the government is not providing um, accurate information. And of course, around the world, we've seen that the year of COVID-19 has also been a year of political upheaval and protests, and citizen journalists have played an important role there. But it is very different now. Um, the, the platforms are walled gardens. There are couple of very important platforms. It is harder to, and, and so therefore their rules um, determine what gets seen or not. It's also very hard to generate the media attention that citizen journalists used to because everyone is doing it now. So the dynamics are different, but it's still really important to have all of these different perspectives. Um, and so I think that we continue to see the importance of both citizen and professional journalism existing in this ecosystem about some of the citizen journalists in Wuhan who really helped inform the world that this thing was coming. Um, they, they were disappeared. Do, do we know what happened to them? Um, unfortunately, China is not very forthcoming with what it does to its prisoners. So some of them are still missing. Chen Shishi, who is one of the first um, citizen journalists to be disappeared, has been reappeared. Um, but the problem is that China, which is the world's leading jailer of journalists, is also, of course, engaging in massive human rights violations in Xinjiang. Um, we have seen that their use of surveillance technology and now under cover of COVID has made it virtually impossible for um, an independent press to operate. It's very dangerous um, for journalists to work there and for anyone. And the problem is it's very hard right now to hold China accountable. Um, they are set to host the Olympics. And, you know, this is a very challenging thing to let China, which is engaged in what, you know, the UN has essentially called a genocide um, in not so many words, but, you know, the massive human rights violations there are something that the entire world should care about because it affects our ability to know what's going on in the pandemic, um, not to mention basic humanity. Let's bring it back home. Uh, you mentioned this has been also a year of political uprising. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the movement for racial equality here in the United States, the January 6th insurrection in the US Capitol. Um, tell us about those, um, those movements um, with respect to press freedom and curtailing of press freedom. I've been doing press freedom for uh, over a decade now, and it was amazing to see what was happening in the United States. Um, the violence that we saw perpetrated against journalists during the Black Lives Matter and the anti-police brutality protests that we saw throughout the summer was shocking. So actually back in 2017, the Committee to Protect Journalists helped found the US Press Freedom Tracker. And we have been tracking systematically incidents of anti-press violence and repression and retaliation. And during the period um, over the summer of the protests here, we saw more than nine, we got reports of more than 900 incidents. We investigate each one that the Press Freedom Tracker does and documents it on their website. 
Now, what we found is that uh, law enforcement was specifically targeting journalists, that it was very obvious in many cases that they were journalists, they were identified as journalists, and yet law enforcement targeted them. We also saw targeting by protesters. Everyone wants to control the narrative, a lot of heightened tensions. And then, of course, we saw during the um, insurrection here that journalists were attacked. They were accused of being fake news, fake media. There was something scrawled on a door about murdering journalists. Equipment was damaged. But unfortunately, this is just continuing a trend that we have seen throughout the year. And we saw, you know, just yesterday, there were reports in Minnesota of violence against the press about arrests. Uh, the problem is, is that the public has a right to be informed and journalists have a duty to report on these newsworthy events. And it is law enforcement's responsibility to uphold the constitution and to protect journalists who are out there reporting in the public interest, reporting on matters of you know, urgent importance and they are by definition newsworthy. So it's really disturbing to see this level of violence and it sets a terrible precedence for our you know, messaging abroad and, and, and it provides cover for repression around the world. Yeah, heady day, more heady days to come in, in Minneapolis. Absolutely. We're following closely uh, the Chauvin trial and another another murder a few days ago. Um, let's go back, back abroad. Um, autocracies on the rise in many countries, leaders who suppress the truth coming to power. Um, how is that impacting press freedom and, and where are you looking in particular? Well, it's not good for press freedom. <laughs> Um, autocracy has never been good for press freedom, but unfortunately what we're seeing now is that a lot of democracies are becoming autocratic. Hungary, Poland, the Philippines, Mexico, <laughs> Brazil, and the United States. You know, we are seeing around the world that there is this trend towards nationalist populism, towards autocracy, um, and that the press is at the forefront of the crackdown and, and the repression. Um, we often say that journalists are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. And they are, you know, oftentimes if you see a crackdown on journalists targeting the press, that could precipitate a broader crackdown on civil, political rights, human rights. So it's very disturbing because in Hungary, uh, we've seen the evisceration of the free press in Poland. He's trying to fault Duda is trying to follow on Orban, Prime Minister Orban's coattails. We've seen um, in Brazil that the president has adopted the fake news rhetoric that President Trump was so well known for. And he's adopted a lot of the same tactics, you know, right after um, uh, President Trump was, uh, let's see, he canceled the subscription, I think it was to the Post or the New York Times. And then the next day, we saw that the president of Brazil did the same thing to the Fallo de Brazil, which is their big paper. So there's a real demonstration effect. Meanwhile, he, you know, in the Philippines, you've got Maria Ressa, who is one of the world's most renowned journalists. She was person of the year a couple of years ago. Um, she's on trial for reporting. Um, she's on trial under a law for cybercrime that did not even exist when the article in question came about. And, you know, as someone who has worked in repressive countries, like it is really scary to see what's going on. And the fact that there has been a vacuum in leadership around the world, there's, you know, no one who's really standing up and defending the free press. You've got Britain and Canada who created this media freedom coalition, but, you know, when you have the United States pull back from its leadership role, no matter how um, hypocritical, some might see that it did make a difference. And um, we've seen the repercussions of that around the world in this rise of autocracy and the crackdown on the press that has accompanied it. One of the latest hotspots in recent weeks has been Myanmar. Tell us what's happening there with respect to um, oppression of journalists. So of course, the crackdown on journalists was one of the first things that we saw during the military coup. Uh, we saw journalists attacked, uh, taken to jail, seen their uh, equipment taken. Also, though, a broader crackdown on kind of the information infrastructure. So, you know, cutting off internet service, slowing it down, um, restricting access to various sites. You know, this all has an impact because again, going back to the, the earlier point about, you know, informal journalists and citizen journalists, you know, that is really critical for them to be able to get this information out. 
Uh, so Myanmar were very concerned about what's happening there. Um, they had a terrible press freedom record uh, under the previous military junta. And, you know, a couple of years ago, Wallon and Kyao so -u, two Reuters reporters, were imprisoned for reporting on what the UN called a genocide there. So, you know, this, this intersection of political crackdowns, um, uh, retaliation against the press and targeting of the press for reporting on human rights violations or on health issues or on political issues. You know, there's there's no issue now that doesn't constitute a red line in some countries. We've been hearing nonstop about, of course, the, the latest news that the U.S. will pull out of Afghanistan very soon. Um, I, ha I don't know that I've heard this angle talked about. When the U.S. does leave, um, how might that affect the ability to be a journalist and report from Kabul and elsewhere in Afghanistan? That's a that's a good question. And I think we don't know. It has been very dangerous to be a journalist in Afghanistan. And in 2019, we saw one of the deadliest attacks on a group of journalists in, in history with um, 10 journalists in Afghanistan killed. We've seen several killed already this year. So it is a very dangerous place to be a journalist. Um, you know, I, 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 can't, I think it's hard to say that the US has been there for 20 years. Um, so the information environment, the reporting environment, the politics, everything was so very different. So I think it's very hard to tell, but I think it is safe to say that it's not going to be an easy place to report. And journalists who live there, as well as any journalists who fly in to kind of cover you know, the withdrawal or whatever need to make sure that they are doing their risk assessments, that they have the right safety equipment and training and know uh, the dangers that they're going into. Thanks to the audience, by the way, for chiming in with questions. Uh, um, in about 23 minutes or so, we're going to um, take some, do, do a little Q&A and let, uh, I'll, um, I'll dictate some of these questions to Courtney. Um, Jamal Khashoggi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, um, the Saudi American Washington Post columnist who was murdered uh, in, sorry, was it, was it Ankara? In the, uh, in the he was murdered in Istanbul. In now. Istanbul. Um, what's happening on that front? Update us. Yeah, um, so Jamal Hashokshi was a an, uh, columnist for the Washington Post. He lived uh, just around the corner in Virginia. Here he is a U.S. resident. And unfortunately, what we saw under the Trump administration was an equivocation over holding Saudi Arabia accountable because of the impact that might have economically or in our security um, and weapon sales. Since then, we did see that there has been some, um, you know, there were some Saudi officials that were put under sanctions, but we've really been holding out for the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to be held responsible because all of the intelligence indicates with high probability or not high probability, high confidential uh, confidence that he was uh, aware of, if not ordered the, the murder. So unfortunately, um, we, we saw that Biden has decided not to hold MBS uh, directly responsible. That said, um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has a report that should be made public. And we have heard signs from the administration that they intend to hold Saudi Arabia responsible in some way. But you know, the fact is, is that when you have these intense security relationships and you have this equivocation over you know, how, where human rights and where the murder of American residents should fall in a relationship, we've seen that that just becomes second to these other interests. We were happy to see, however, that some weapons sales um, to Saudi Arabia were halted because of its abuses in Yemen, where there was a war that nobody talks about. Um, Courtney, tell us about the role that surveillance and spyware uh, has been playing on attacks on journalists. So Jamal Hashokshi, um, along with journalists in Mexico who have been murdered, um, that's actually the most deadly country in the world, uh, in, in this hemisphere for journalists, and, and journalists around the world are being targeted with spyware and with surveillance. So spyware infects your phone or your digital devices and allows access to all of your information, even your camera, your audio recorder. And there are indications that um, uh, associates of murdered journalists or their family members have 
and, and even in some cases, journalists have had spyware installed in their devices. We know that there was a massive breach of WhatsApp. Facebook is actually suing NSO Group, which is the company that sells Pegasus, which was um, thought to be, which is thought to be behind that attack, and many uh, and many of the other spyware accounts. We actually did a big project uh, a couple months ago. We just published it on our website, cpj.org/spyware, where you can see men, at least 38 different cases of journalists who have been who have been implicated, where their devices were infected with spyware. We look at the countries um, likely responsible and the companies that sold that. Now. We are working at the um, and the US Congress and in the EU to try to get export restrictions on this very sophisticated surveillance technology um, and human rights impact assessments. But we've also seen, for example, with Project Raven, which was a case in the United Arab Emirates uh, targeting of a Reuters reporter, one of the things that shifted is you probably heard a lot about phishing, you know, don't click on that link, don't open that attachment. But that is a push technology, that, sorry, that is a pull technology. You have to click on something to download it or to get onto your phone. Now we're seeing that there are these push technologies where you don't really need anything more than somebody's email or their phone number to install this malware spyware. So it's a very, very challenging and unequal environment where you've got you know, news organizations that are struggling economically, freelance reporters who don't have a budget for sophisticated digital security. And even if they did, couldn't probably um, you know, keep themselves safe from any of these attacks up against governments that can spend millions of dollars buying this spyware from, from companies that apparently feel no responsibility, um, even when they say that they're only selling their, their uh, surveillance technology to governments for legitimate purposes. I'm pretty sure targeting journalists is not a legitimate purpose. Absolutely not. You mentioned in quotes here, fake news earlier. You know, when we, we you, you were talking about Bolsonaro and Oban and other autocrats, Trump, of course, infamously talked about fake news a lot. That term, I, how, as it's thrown about, what impact does it have on all, all of our ability to, to do our jobs and report? Yeah, well, um, it has a few different types of impact. So first, of course, Hearing um, the President of the United States constantly refer to journalists and journalism as fake news, as enemies of the people, um, and seeing him target individual news outlets and journalists actually had a very detrimental impact and in some cases caused real threats against the journalists and news outlets that were targeted. We know there were bombs sent to several news organizations, um, I want to say it was in 2018. We saw that when uh, President Trump targeted a specific journalist, that journalist would get a lot of online harassment threats. And if you're a woman, you probably included rape threats. Uh, minority journalists, Jewish journalists were targeted. So it had you know, a very real impact on the journalists who were, uh, who were targeted. Meanwhile, it created this rhetoric around um, journalism and journalists being enemies of the people. Now it's hard to draw a direct line between that and how the press was treated um, over the past year and the protests that we talk about, talked about earlier. But you know, one has to wonder. Meanwhile, abroad, we saw that that terminology became one of the favorite ways of autocrats and repressive leaders like Putin and Xi Jinping to legitimate their crackdown. They adopted that rhetoric with glee. We saw you know, the Chinese news agency welcome the use of the term and saying, hey, welcome to what we've known for years. We saw Egypt, uh, President Sisi use that term. In fact, Egypt is the country leading the world in jailing journalists on fake news or false news charges. Now, CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, where, where I work, we systematically track the imprisonment of journalists. And we've always had this category called false news, but it usually has like one to a handful of, of journalists um, every year imprisoned on that term or uh, under that, um, that legal framework. So what we saw in the past few years is a significant rise in the number of journalists imprisoned on false news charges. So that's a pretty direct link between rising rhetoric around the world and translating that rhetoric into legislative frameworks and then using that to crack down on the press. So it has had a very real impact. And of course, 
Um, other organizations have studied more than we have about what impact that has had on trust in the media, but we're all part of this ecosystem and, and it's all interlinked. So, you know, we are looking forward to getting back to a more you know, respectful tone for the role that the press plays in American democracy. I mean, the press is specifically mentioned in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And I think that as Americans, we really value our constitutional rights, our First Amendment rights, and the role that journalists play in holding government, business, and, and everyone accountable, as well as keeping them informed. When did we begin to hear the, this term fake news used in this accusatory way? Was it with Trump? Was it earlier than that? Wait, let's track this. Whoa. Yeah, um, we saw it during the campaign uh, in 20, so in 2016 and 2017, we saw a rise and my colleague, Stephanie Sugars, um, who now works for Freedom of the Press Foundation and they run the, the US Press Freedom Tracker. She actually kept a database of all of President Trump's tweets that targeted the press. And if I recall correctly, there are more than a thousand and she kind of tracked how that, that terminology and that targeting um, rose, how it went from fake news to enemies of the people. Um, so, you know, if you're interested, I'm sure you can Google it, you'll find it. Uh, and you can check um, pressfreedomtracker.us. So it, you know, we saw there, there is documentation. It was very real. And we saw that in, in the impact of online harassment. I mean, online harassment has now become an endemic part of being a journalist, especially if you're a journalist of color, a woman, uh, any sort of minority identity. If you're working on, if you're writing about, you know, women's issues or women's health, uh, if you're writing about disinformation campaigns, then you get targeted by, by disinformation. So it's a very very challenging environment to work in. And, you know, a lot of that has been fueled by this anti-press rhetoric and sentiment and threats um, over the past few years. Let's talk about platforms and apps um, for a bit. I mean, of course, Facebook and Twitter have become portals by which to disseminate news or even newsmakers themselves. Um, you know, and of course, they, they've played a big role. I mean, they Trump's accounts were shut down after January 6th, and we've heard less from him on social media since then. Um, what what role do you think Facebook and Twitter and other apps ought to be playing? What what um, what good can they do? What harm can they do? How would you advise them to proceed? Well, I think we need to distinguish between platforms that hold kind of monopolistic conditions or, you know, a lot of power over what gets seen in the world. And so that's really Facebook, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. Um, they are, you know, these massive multi-billion multi dollar companies. And, you know, in some countries like the Philippines, Myanmar, Facebook is the equivalent of the internet. Most people only access Facebook and they have this thing called, well, it used to be called Free Basics. Essentially, they subsidize internet access via Facebook through uh, an interface that, you, that they then don't charge for data in these countries where data plans can be expensive. So they have um, a gatekeeper role that is really phenomenal in terms of the international um, information environment. Twitter is a little bit different because it's much smaller, way less profitable, but it's very influential. But it's influential because the influencers are there. So it's interesting to see uh, a lot of world leaders from Angela Merkel to the president of Mexico, uh, and, and I think, was it Hungary? I think Poland actually uh, proposed a law to prohibit deplatforming. Um, without without a right by platforms. Um, I think it's really problematic because I think the it, personally, in my opinion, not not um, CPJs, but you know the the issue here is not that you know any one platform can decide what their terms of service are or who should be able to be seen or heard or amplified. It's the fact that if you only have a few choices, then it becomes really problematic. And one of the principles, the foundational principles of press freedom, is pluralism. So we need a pluralistic media environment. And in some areas, that's really not taking place. Now, I think that we need to look at the whole information environment because, of course, Facebook, Twitter, Google exist in the media ecosystem. Mainstream media depends on them. They depend on the mainstream media. We're seeing some very interesting experiments to try to equal out some of the imbalance in the economic power of these actors. So in Australia, 
they have um, they are looking at a draft law that would require that Google and Facebook, so major big social media companies, subsidize or license uh, the news snippets that they use from news outlets. And the idea there is that they are trying to rebalance the the economic power. You know, Google and Facebook between them. Uh, control the vast majority of the digital marketing infrastructure. And they have also created the, the contours of the market. So we live in an era of what Shoshana Zuboff, a professor at Harvard, calls surveillance capitalism. And so even if you want to abide by a different set of rules or not you know, take part in that, econ that attention economy, it becomes very difficult. So you know, entire newsrooms have reoriented themselves around what Facebook is doing. So when Facebook said, hey, we're gonna prioritize video and hey, it's doing really well on our platforms, you saw news organizations around the world pivot to video only to find out a couple of years later that some of that data was falsified and not accurate. Um, similarly, you know, the algorithm, algorithms of amplification, of visibility, of monetization, all have an impact on the sustainability of media. So right now it's a very difficult uh, balance because most media, you know, with the exception of big corporate media are hanging on by a shoestring. We've seen massive amounts of closures of news outlets, struggling to find new economic models, um, nonprofit news organizations, et cetera. But you know, they're up against an information environment where they depend on a few gatekeepers to get their message out. Now, you could, you know, many organizations have said, okay, we're going to go back to a subscription model or, you know, they're going to try new things. And I think that's, that's good. If we go back to the politicians and their rights to access um, the platforms, I think it's interesting to remember that, you know, President Trump or President Biden, for that matter, can give a press conference whenever they want. They can marshal the media to cover them and the media and the public will go to whatever platform they choose. So, you know, the idea that they're kicked off of one platform or the other, in my personal opinion, uh, is less problematic than the idea that they were using those platforms to manipulate elections, spread disinformation, uh, undermine public health, and other forms of ills. Courtney, um, faith in the media and journalism seems to be sinking in, in, in some places. In the United States, there seems to be a population a segment that doesn't have faith in, 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 in the media. Speak to a 16 or 18 year old, um, a young person, um, the, impo uh, the importance in, in journalism in their lives, in our society, um, and direct them, how should they know what news to follow to consume? Well, I'd ask people to think about what do you know? What do we know about the sexual abuse scandal against the women gymnasts of USA Gymnastics? How did we find out about the sexual abuse scandal um, of priests? How did we find out about environmental degradation at Standing Rock? Um, how did we find out about, you know, the episodic extreme differentiation between levels of violence against black people compared to white people by police because journalists covered it. They dug in, they wanted to hold, they wanted to find out the answers to some questions. They, you know, maybe they went to the courthouse every single day. They've covered that beat. They got access to data. They cultivated sources that is what journalism is about. It's not just snapping a picture and then posting it online. That can be very important, but that's what I would call a source, not journalism. So you really have to look at the intent of journalism. And, you know, most of what we know is because we learned it, you know, from journalists. They're the ones who are covering what um, is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the problems I think that we've seen with this decline in trust and this idea that like, well, what's the difference between journalism and anyone else posting on social media is because so much of local journalism has disappeared. Many people have never met a journalist. There are you know, so-called news deserts around the United States and in many places of the world. So that means you know, they're not seeing the link of local news and what's happening that's important to them in their daily lives. 
And, you know, there is this bifurcation at the national news. It's, you know, very politics heavy. I remember being in Egypt and, you know, seeing how so much of the news there, um, you know, during Mubarak was really focused on national politics. And, you know, most people, that's not what is uh, important in their daily lives. Not that it is not important to cover, but this absence of local news has profound repercussions. So, you know, when you're getting information, it's really important to see who is the source. Facebook is not a source. It's like saying you got your news on the telephone, right? So you want to look at who is the source. Is that source reputable? Um, do they have a history of covering this topic or whatever it is? So I think it's important that we educate ourselves about how to, um, how to consume information and what is the difference between journalism, polemics, propaganda, um, and make that effort to really understand the value that journalism, that good reporting, whether it's investigative journalism or the day-to-day -day beat reporting plays in our daily lives and our ability to hold public institutions, private institutions, and others accountable. How can International Affairs Forum members, interlocking public radio listeners, citizens in general, Americans, uh, support press freedom? Well, first, I, I think you could read the bylines or you know check who wrote that newsletter that you get in your inbox. Who is the reporter on that radio station or TV show that you're watching? Who, who are they? Those are people who have decided to devote their lives to journalism. And every year, like last year, more than 70 of their colleagues paid the ultimate price for doing journalism. They lost their lives. And the majority of that are murdered. Um, many of them are behind bars. They put their health at risk. Um, but it's not just about the risk. You know, th these reporters um, are our, our windshield, you know, our, sorry, our spotlight into what's happening around the world. And so I think if you want to support press freedom, it's first to be aware. Think about where you get your information. Um, subscribe to news or newsletters, um, news outlets that you value, where you feel like, oh, I want this information, you know, your public radio station, uh, wherever you get your news, because it costs money to bring the news. It costs money to go every day to the courthouse and send a reporter. It costs money to get data sets. More and more of our information from the government it has to be requested through a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request, which takes time and resources. You have to protect yourself against getting sued. I mean, there are so many costs associated with journalists, journalism. So think about it. When you read that story about the troop withdrawal in Afghanistan with that anecdote on the ground in Kabul, think about the costs, both you know, economic and personal that, that went into bringing you that, that piece of news. And then take action. Um, you know, you might see a petition come across your email or in your Twitter feed, you know, a, a hashtag. We, you know, sometimes people dismiss that as slacktivism, but I can tell you from talking to many journalists who we have helped get out from behind bars or, um, you know, after they have been attacked and we've come out in solidarity um, to drown out their online attackers, it makes a difference. So Maria Ressa, who I mentioned, is this you know, fantastic, amazing journalist in the Philippines. We have a campaign for her. It's called Hold the Line. It's hashtag Hold the Line. And we're telling the Filipino president, Duterte, that we are holding the line for independent journalism in the Philippines, and we're standing in solidarity with Maria Ressa. We have a Free the Press campaign, again, that hashtag on all the social medias. And we will highlight different cases of journalists who are behind bars and we're trying to free them. So that might mean that we're doing a letter, we might do a mission, we might meet with the president, not these days because of COVID, um, but we will be trying to get them out from behind bars. So, you know, you can go to cpj.org, go to take action, and there are a bunch of different ways to get involved. And you can follow us on, you know, social media and see those cases that we're advocating for and get involved, lend your voice, it does make a difference. With respect to journalists doing incredible, important work and holding uh, leaders accountable, where do you see hope? Where, where's your optimism? Uh, <laughs> my optimism, I think, is somehow in the silver lining of this horrific time that we're living through, 
with COVID and this pandemic, we have discovered the fundamental importance of journalism, of public health information, of truth, uh, of reporting on, you know, what is the science saying? What are reliable officials saying? Um, and then also now this reckoning with historic structures of racism and oppression and the role that journalism has played in perpetuating those and in some cases in dismantling them. And so I have hope that we are increasingly talking about journalism as a profession and a practice that really has profound implications on the practice of democracy and in our daily lives. And I think that, you know, there are some surveys that show an increase in trust. So I'm holding on to those amid kind of a dreary picture for press freedom globally. Thanks for that. Let's go to audience questions. We have about 15 minutes. Um, thanks to everyone who's, um, who's writing questions into the Zoom chat here in the International Affairs Forum Zoom. Um, first question from our, our dear friend, current International Affairs Forum board member and former curator of the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University, Bob Giles, who lives here in Northern Michigan. Um, what are your thoughts on policing social media to encourage truth telling without limiting free speech? Well, we've seen a lot of that being done over the years uh, with fact checking. And it's interesting because, you know, fact checking has sprung up around the world. There is an association of fact checkers and pointer. And that's an important aspect, I think, um, the fact checking, but it is not sufficient. And interestingly, we call it fact checking, but like that kind of is what journalism is. So I'm waiting for when those two things get merged in the public conversation. Um, I think that, you know, that social media also needs to put some guardrails on, you know, personally, and again, this is just my personal opinion, but I think we need to think about commercial speech, paid speech in a different way than we think about, um, you know, personal expression or political expression. You know, why we only have an, you know, ad transparency during elections for a certain type of ads doesn't make any sense because we need to know who is behind paying for the micro-targeting of ads, for the amplification of disinformation. That will help, I think, to hold those entities accountable um, and, and put some guardrails on, which would help, I think, um, rein in some of the social media challenges um, in, this, in this sphere. And, you know, we need a pluralistic environment. We need many different social media platforms so that if you only want to talk about cats, you can kick people off who want to talk about dogs. Like that is the point is that you should be able to cultivate the type of community you want. The problem is, is when you are the only community that becomes, you know, really challenging. But we're seeing some interesting experiments. The Facebook Oversight Board, which some are calling the Supreme Court of Facebook, which is currently deciding about what it thinks of the Trump deplatforming and its uh, decision will be binding on Facebook. So we're waiting to see if they will say that he should be put back on or not. But I think that you need to look at this issue holistically. What role are you know, is disinformation, are certain people, accounts, et cetera, playing in the broader information ecosystem? You know, there was just a report in The Guardian a couple of days ago by a whistleblower from Facebook who uncovered hundreds of fake, or well, not fake accounts, but hundreds of accounts that were um, falsely amplifying political leaders around elections in countries around the world. This is really detrimental to our democracy. So I think there's a lot that can be done to put on uh, restrictions, regulations, greater transparency and accountability on the platforms that actually have very little to do with speech, but that would mitigate a lot of the kind of online harms and disinformation that has perpetuated in the past few years. Here's a question from Richard. Do the foreign language broadcasts sponsored by Western governments have meaningful positive impacts? Uh, yes, I would say that for the most part, um, they do have positive impact. And it's been really interesting over the past year when we've seen 
uh, the US Agency for Global Media, which is responsible for Voice of America, which I think has you know, more than 47 different languages that it broadcasts in. Um, we see RFERL uh, in Russia and, and Belarus playing a really important role in reporting there, and yet they're getting cracked down on. We saw Radio Free Asia uh, reporting on corruption in Malaysia and, and then being charged with fake news and getting kicked out of the country under that auspice. So, you know, these, these um, at least the, the US uh, English language broadcasters have played an important information role in these countries where there are uh, maybe few independent media outlets where um, they're able to report in the local language. And there are also global outlets, you know, obviously the BBC, which is slightly different, um, uh, the Radio Free Netherlands, Deutsche Welle, um, there are many English language broadcasters that are also just part of an important dynamic of creating a pluralistic information environment. You know, uh, I worked at the New York Times and I worked at a Saudi organization, you know, Saudi news organization. In all, both cases and everything in between, I was trying to do good journalism, but the fulcrum at which you balance that and you, when, what you, perspectives you portray and your starting point is different depending on where you're reporting. So I think it's important to have um, these English language broadcasters as long as they maintain their independence. They're not an arm of the foreign policy establishment. And that's why we were so concerned last year um, during the politicization of the US Agency for Global Media and the appointment of uh, someone who really undermined the independence of that institution and then refused to like renew the visas of these journalists who are reporting in local languages and in some cases are one of the only independent news outlets reporting. So we need to see, I think, a more robust defense uh, of, of their independence and their role in providing a, an information from these more restricted countries. You're listening to a special presentation of the International Affairs Forum on Interlochen Public Radio. And we're taking questions for the next uh, nine minutes or so. Um, via the webinar, which you'll find on the web at tciaf.com. Uh, here's a question from Barbara. Could you please define press these days with many business models and sectarian press outlets? How has this variety impacted how the press is perceived around the world? That's a great question, and I'm definitely going to avoid defining press. I mean, that is a big issue that we run into all the time is who counts as a journalist? What counts as press? And frankly, we see many different types of organizations doing what looks like journalism. You know, Human Rights Watch goes out and reports on human rights abuses around the world. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the, the politicized uh, outlets and the partisan outlets. So again, you know, pluralism, very important. I think that we also need to think about what is journalism. So the, pr the press is, is kind of a broad covering term, um, but I think it could be equated with journalism. And if you think about journalism, there are, you know, some principles of what makes something journalism. It's accurate, it's timely, it's fair, it's public interest, um, and that can be broadly, broadly conceived. And you know, there are many different forms of journalism. But I think that if we're talking about you know, the press, it's this idea that there is an institution that is devoted to holding uh, public institutions and private actors accountable. Um, and that can be done in many different ways and in many different formats. But you know, ultimately, there is something that is specific about the press because it is, you know, it is carved out in the First Amendment. And we talk about press freedom and freedom of expression because they are different. There is this institution of the press. And I think we need, I mean, again, like my personal opinion as someone who's been a journalist, um, worked in, in different countries, and studied the media. We need that institution in politics. We need that uh, as the fourth, you know, in unofficial branch of government uh, to have a strong and stable democracy. So I think that you know there is also a role for um, kind of the the field of journalism to play in policing its own and you know to to uphold the highest values of journalism so that they don't let people who aren't doing journalism like call themselves journalists. But the fact is, is we're gonna defend anyone who's doing journalism because even if you're doing 
bad journalism, you don't deserve to be attacked or put in prison or killed. So for the committee to protect journalists, we're gonna defend people who are doing journalism. If we're thinking about press freedom, then we really need to think about making sure that we enable the environment. So you know, if we look at the case of Assange, um, the, the charges leveled against him include many things that look like journalism that journalists do all the time, you know, talking to confidential sources, trying to get confidential information or classified information uh, and that sort of thing. So sometimes protecting press freedom is also about protecting the legal environment in which press freedom can operate. Thanks. And Carla's question relates a bit to that. Um, does the Committee to Protect Journalists join with other advocacy organizations such as Amnesty International or also journalism schools to seek freedom and protection for journalists? Oh, yes. I mean, this press freedom, you know, advocating for press freedom, fighting for press freedom is a job that takes many, many organizations. There is a lot of work to do. We are always working together with Amnesty, with Human Rights Watch, with local press freedom organizations around the world. Um, we're one of the founding members of the of IFEX, which is an umbrella group of, I think, more than 90 uh, press freedom and digital rights organizations around the world. We helped found a culture of safety alliance, the ACOS Alliance, which uh, is organizations, news organizations uh, working together to protect journalists and, and keep, create a culture of safety in newsrooms. We have to work together, um, especially trying to get journalists out of jail. You know, it is a long, long slog. I mean, the Reuters journalists, uh, Wallon and Kyoso, ooh, we worked for more than a year to get them out of jail. We went to the UN Secretary General. Um, he had amazing lawyers. Reuters was behind them every way. We did an event with Amal Clooney, their lawyer, and the editor in chief of Reuters at the UN. And, you know, we had to do that together. We did campaigns. That's just on one case. Now imagine there are 250 journalists behind bars um, in our last census. So there is plenty of work to do. We, we definitely work together a lot. Tell us about uh, challenges to press freedom for journalists reporting on climate change and other environmental issues. That is becoming, I would say that's going to, we're going to see that become an increasingly dangerous beat. Um, so we do know that in many countries, journalists who are reporting on environmental issues are at risk. Um, sometimes this coincides with other issues like uh, the staging of the Olympics in Russia or China. There were some, hum there were some um, environmental issues related with that uh, delocalization of, of populations, um, environmental degradation, and the reporters reporting on those issues were attacked, were arrested, were in some case in cases imprisoned. We've seen in other cases, especially in rural areas and indigenous journalists that they're at risk. Uh, they're covering their local communities. They're, the environmental issues are bumping up against political or economic issues. And unfortunately, we have seen several journalists who cover the environment uh, killed. So I think that as we see climate change become more and more of a political issue, a human rights issue, and affect more and more people's daily lives who aren't in the undercover rural areas or lack access to kind of the mainstream press, we're gonna see that become even more centered in the press freedom debate. Uh, question from Karen, assuming air quotes here, liberal journalists consider their sources and reporting credible and conservative journalists believe the same of the reporting. How do we bridge this gap? Um, I don't really think that there are liberal and conservative journalists. I mean, there are uh, journalists and then there are people who are also you know, politically liberal or politically conservative. But I mean, the thing about journalists is that when you're doing journalism, you're not doing politics. And so you know, I think there are credible sources and credibility is not dependent, um, you know, on who you are. On the other hand, as a constructivist and, you know, thinking about, as I said earlier, working from the New York Times versus a Saudi news outlet, 
you know, people will have different perspectives on credibility based on their lived experience. I think that our racial reckoning that we're going through now is illustrating that, you know, a lot of the credible scientists um, or social, you know, social scientists over the years who have perpetuated racist um, ideas, who have perpetuated racist policies, you know, so it, I think it's very complicated. It doesn't, it's not just about conservative and liberal um, and that credibility is, I guess, both objective and subjective in different ways. Sorry, I know that's not like a great, you know, clear answer, but I think that we have to look at the complexity um, of how we determine, you know, different truths, but that there are still facts um, that will determine credibility. Question from Nick, what advice would you have to a young journalist student preparing to enter the profession? So I would definitely say um, understand what press freedom means and make sure that you're prepared. I had no idea about any of this journalist safety stuff when I went to Lebanon the first time. And looking back now, you know, reporting in the south of Lebanon and running into Hezbollah and going into a, a training camp that was, anyways, there are a lot of issues that I definitely feel very grateful for um, getting out of without severe repercussions. Um, so know, know your safety, know what a risk assessment is, get prepared. Um, and then if you're interested in, you know, reporting on your local community or you're interested in going abroad, you know, find, find a way to do that either on your own or interning for uh, you know, a local news organization. I mean, one of the ways that I kind of started to get into journalism is I worked for the student paper and then I did, I did blogging. You know, if you're just starting out, you can do reporting, you can do journalism um, and you can get it published. Uh, ideally, you will get it paid for, but you might need to pay, you know, some dues at the beginning. And I think that, you know, there are certain principles of journalism, again, like the reporting, interviewing, um, you're going to want to learn how to be an all purpose journalist, use your, you know, to use your phone for video, sound editing and all of that. But I think it's a really exciting time to be a journalist. I consider myself a journalist and I, and I do that on a regular basis and it's really fulfilling and exciting. So go for it. Great final words. Courtney, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciated the chat. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, Courtney, let me thank you from all of us at the International Affairs Forum. This has been a, a great program. You definitely bring a lot of passion to what you're doing, as you should. I mean, you're there to protect those journalists, and that's, a, that's an awesome job. So thank you again for taking the time and informing us of what's going on around the world and, and how we can help as well. And as Courtney mentioned, you can go to the CPJ website and check out what they're doing. If you do, it's, it's not just Courtney and, and an office manager that's doing that work. It's a, it's a lot of people that are really engaged. So thank you again, Courtney, for joining us. Thank you for those of you listening uh, both through Zoom and on IPR. And this has been a presentation of the International Affairs Forum at Northwestern Michigan College, simulcast on Zoom and Interlochen Public Radio. <laughs>